yeah we will be recording this and so we will start off with uh, Anthony Mushiri uh, and we are glad that he is with us <clears throat> and uh, as he puts up his uh, presentation allow me to tell you who Anthony is Anthony is a medical oncologist and clinical researcher <clears throat> He works with the International Cancer Institute, Department of Clinical Care and Precision Medicine. He's involved in various cancer screening and early detection initiatives for breast and cervical cancer <clears throat> in Kenya. He's passionate about patient advocacy, timely diagnosis and optimal therapeutics. He'll talk about the role of primary healthcare workers in early detection of lung cancer. He'll also highlight the risk factors, the issues around cancer screening, clinical presentation for lung cancer, diagnosis, and a bit of overview on matters with treatment for lung cancer. <clears throat> As he does this, we've had a huge conversation since yesterday. If you've been following through the mainstream media citizen, there has been quite a talk around cancer generally, and the conversation still continue today uh, in the mid morning around the what is happening currently around the laws that have been passed, others which are, uh, have had some bit of issues. <clears throat> no, I, I think the discussions around this kind of topic, and especially today, is quite in order. And since again, uh, it's it's a topic that we need information on, and then the patients that come to us need our support and care. And since it's it's measured on uh, educating primary healthcare providers, you know the first people that will meet patients in the different areas of, of, of our work. So I want to invite him to take us on from there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, David, and uh, a warm welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us today, and uh, I'm happy to add my voice onto the the big conversation that we are having uh, as a country. And I'll be checking you through this uh, uh, talk or presentation on the role of primary health care providers, givers, or workers, whatever you like to call them, in the early detection of lung cancer. So these are my objectives, uh, probably uh, types of lung cancer, risk factors, the clinical presentation, early detection diagnosis, uh, prevention and positive screening, and the role for the uh, primary healthcare workers or givers in this uh, early detection. Yeah. And the best way to start with this, I thought of uh, giving you two case summaries on a couple of patients throughout our clinic here, so that you can just like, get a context on uh, how they present, and uh, so the presentation will be much, much more uh, palatable when understood. So uh, the first case is a 50-year-old man, a farmer of summer habits, uh, presenting complaints of persistent cough um, with associated these symptoms. And uh, at that time, chest X-ray done showed widespread opacities bilaterally, and the picture was suggestive of a PTB. Uh, Spartan for gene expert done was negative, However, due to the clinical picture of the X-ray, this patient was started on HCBs, which it did the past course for uh, six months. But from the history, it was clear that there, there was no improvement and the cough actually worsened. I repeat, uh, videograph, still worsening of opacification opus, actually. And uh, still the same uh, routine, repeat, uh, spartan for gene expert check for uh, drug resistant uh, uh, bacteria. None was found to still negative. What do they do? Second line anti TBs, but still no respect for this patient. So uh, a change of doctors here and there in the city is recommended, and they find a left upper lobe uh, speculated uh, uh, speculated uh, mass measuring uh, 4.2 uh, by 2.7, and also the pancreatic carcinomatosis on both lungs, which now had appeared to be uh, like the miliary picture for uh, TB. 
So what happens is that uh, this uh, patient proceeds and gets a, a CT guided biopsy and confirms to have small cell lung cancer, adenocarcinoma. Second case, uh, you can see the first case was a 50 year old. Second case is that 35 year old, also a male, a farmer in a part of two, similar history of sober habits, but, uh, presenting complaints of persistent left shoulder pains and right distal thigh pains with no other constant symptoms, denied chest symptoms at all, uh, even weight loss was not apparently even present. And so orthopedic review, um, uh, because of persistent pain, showed uh, on, on, on MRIs, showed some lytic lesions, suspicious for malignancy, and hence a referral to the oncology department. So on examination, this patient had a uh, tenderness on the left shoulder with reduced range of motion and had a small palpable swelling on the right anterior thigh. Uh, chest exam, uh, the doctor found some uh, right upper lobe uh, dullness. So we passed this patient for uh, some further scans just to work him up. And uh, the first CT chest showed heterogeneous enhancing uh, consolidative lesion on the right lung upper lobe. And subsequently, more workups with the PET CT showed uh, a corroborating or a correlating mass at the same area upper lobe, measuring 4.5 by 2.7, with an SCV max of 7.2, as well as uh, some higher and medicinal lymphadenopathy. Uh, the patient also picked for multiple mixed lytic and sclerotic lesions uh, and also muscular deposits in the anterior right thigh. So again, a CT guided biopsy uh, confirmed lung cancer and lung cancer adenocarcinoma and the patient is shown on the uh, right therapy. The last case, and then I go to my talk, 65 year old, this is a female, a postmenopausal female, uh, hypertensive well controlled. And the history was quite uh, atypical in that this patient presented with a frontal swelling uh, early this year with uh, no really associated symptoms prior to that. And uh, MRI done, showed brain tumor 5 by 5 by 4.7 in the frontal lobe uh, with scalp and scapula invasion. So she had a craniotomy uh, of the tumor excision. And histology was quite interesting because it depicted uh, metastatic adenocarcinoma. And subsequently, immunosochemistry with the markers are shown here, uh, determined it to be a lung adenocarcinoma, which had metastasis in the brain. So for the same patient, uh, PET CT done, now picked uh, a, a, a right upper lobe, uh, a left upper lobe uh, lung mass, speculated, measuring 17 by 25 by 19, with an SAV max of 6.9, and also had uh, some paraotic and left hilar uh, nodes. Uh, as well as some lytic lesion in the L L2 uh, with an SV max of 11.75 uh, and uh, of course the other findings. And so you can see uh, this was indicative of a, a possible lung primary and uh, it is correlated now with the histology that was done in the IHC. So this was concluded to be a stage four lung cancer disease with a brain metastasis and uh, we put this patient on the inside treatment. So directly to my talk, I think uh, needless to say, I won't say what lung cancer is, but I'll go direct to say that uh, lung cancer has two components or two types, two main types. So we have the non-small cell uh, uh, lung cancer, and then we have the small cell uh, lung cancer. So uh, uh, needless to say, non-small cell lung cancer is what is more common in our setting. I think comprises of more than 80% of what we see in our clinics uh, on routine for lung cancer patients. And uh, the nerve small cell also is subdivided into other subtypes. And the, uh, we have the squamous cell carcinoma, we have the adenocarcinoma, and the large cell carcinoma. Of this, uh, we have a squamous cell carcinoma having more, uh, affecting more people, uh, followed by adenocarcinoma, uh, also quite uh, common as well. But we have the adenocarcinoma associated with smoking much more frequently. And then we have the small cell. Uh, uh, lung cancer. So we have the old cell and the mixed type. Also, uh, of, all of note is that the small cell lung cancer is more associated with the uh, smoking, which is much more aggressive, but fortunately also responds to uh, therapy quite nicely. But the reason why I say it's quite aggressive is that uh, most of these patients actually uh, they represent with uh, those atypical presentation, the bone and the brain. Uh, that's what we have noted for these patients uh, most of the time. For the non small cell lung cancer, com compared to the small cell lung cancer, then we would say it is a little bit more indolent, but nonetheless, 
quite an invasive disease once it has spread. So I'll also uh, highlight on this data that we got from the Global Can, uh, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, on the 2020 estimates of uh, uh, lung cancer, and this of the the, the the global picture for how it looks like uh, globally. So you can see, uh, well, breast cancer is still the commonest diagnosed cancer globally, with at least uh, 2.2 million, uh, followed by lung cancer. Was uh, just marginally at uh, 2.2. That represents about 11 percent, 11.4 percent of all lung cancer cases. But now, on the flip side, if you look at the mortality for these uh, patients, you find lung cancer is taking the the lion's share with 1.7 uh, million deaths out of the 2.2, and that is about 18 percent of all the mortality uh, for cancers. Coming back to home now, uh, and the picture is. Uh, Quite different in terms of what is really uh, prevalent uh, in Kenya. Lung cancer actually features quite distant at uh, number seven, if I'm not wrong. But we have breast, cervical, prostate, and esophageal cancer, and the colorectal being the, the commonest cancers that's seen. But now to this uh, nice table here, you can see uh, where lung cancer falls, uh, where I put the red uh, uh, arrow. You can see. Uh, it's quite down the list, but you can see in terms of the mortality, then uh, it is really uh, uh, quite significant in terms of uh, uh, the mortality for it is quite high up there with cervical cancer and the rest. So uh, the question is, where are these cases for these uh, patients? You can see uh, 794 diagnosed, 729 died. That's literally like above 90% uh, uh, mortality for some of these patients that we see. And perhaps we'll touch on some reasons for for this for this why it's happening. So in terms of risk factors for cancer, what is widely known, I think, is by now it should be common knowledge to everyone. About uh, ninety percent of lung cancers are uh, strongly associated with uh, smoking, and uh, so we have um, an estimated relative risk of lung cancer in the long term for smokers. Uh, that is the heavy smokers as high as 30% compared to 1% for the non-smokers. And then we have other safe risk factors in terms of smoking. How many number of cigarettes do you smoke? Uh, the lifetime duration of smoking, the age at onset of smoking, the degree of inhalation, the content of tar and nicotine in these cigars and most so the unfiltered cigars. And uh, subsequently, more data has shown that smoking cessation actually decreases the risk of lung cancer by about 20 to 90%. And that's a big difference if you look at it. And then adults who quit smoking can gain uh, six to 10 years of their life expectancy depending at the age uh, they quit smoking altogether. And then we have smoking reduction has also specifically that decreased uh, a risk of lung cancer. So you see all of this, the evidence is quite compelling on the association between smoking and development of lung cancer, be it the non-small cell or the small cell lung cancer. Uh, there's none that favors the other. Uh, additional points of co-factors to smoking, we also have the second-hand smoke, that is passive smoking. We have the cigars and five smokings, we have the marijuana, we have the cocaine, we have the, what you call, vape of the e-cigarettes, we have the shishas. All of these have been implicated on uh, being a uh, possible position or risk factors for lung cancer. And this is just a picture of the damage that uh, smoking and the contents of smoking uh, does on the lung brain climate tissues. Uh, continuation of the risk factors we have now the occupational and the environmental exposures. And so here we have the asbestos, the random gases, the house of smokes, the air pollution uh, from uh, automobiles and other uh, mechanical uh, vehicles that we have. Uh, other factors include uh, previous treatments, probably with radiotherapy. We have uh, chronic inflammatory lung conditions like COPDs. We have uh, genetics and family history, and also some oncogenic viruses such as uh, uh, HPV, HIV, and the likes have also been implicated as a risk factors for lung cancer. So, in terms of the clinical picture of how these patients, patients pre present and how you can pick it up. Definitely, history is key. Uh, we can never speak enough about it. So you pick history of a cough with associated dyspnea, odopnea, weight loss, fevers, 
and also the duration of smoking. You have to check the pack years for these patients and any other underlying comorbidities. And then, of course, now corroborate that with your physical examination for these patients. So you would find for a typical lung cancer patient, they would be cachexic, they would probably be in rest distress, uh, they would be saturating and probably a high risk rate. Uh, some would have uh, some efficient consolidation, but you can get a dullness or uh, some uh, crackles on these patients. And for some like the cases they are violated before, you can have bone tenderness and even, even reduce uh, range of motion. And for others, you can get hepatomegaly, lipadinopathies. And uh, for others, if there's a brain involvement, you can also get neurological deficits uh, for them. So in terms of diagnosis, how do we make the diagnosis for lung cancer? So remember, any symptoms will give you a myriad of uh, differential diagnosis. Could be PTP, could be sarcoidosis, could be COPDs, et cetera, et cetera. And so for diagnosis, usually is a multidisciplinary uh, approach of things. So you have radiology, you have interventional radiologists as well, you have pulmonologists, you have pathologists, oncologists, and all these other uh, care providers who will help you make uh, that diagnosis. And so like I've read in my previous slides, um, imaging is really key for lung cancer. And I think uh, for following the composition yesterday, I think uh, the message was that most of the facilities, they either have a chest X-ray or a CT scan that can be able to assess these patients. So we can apply the chest X-ray, we can do CT scans. And now for the PET-CT, that will be carried out by the oncologist once they see the patient is not determine the extent of disease, probably for resection or even for uh, disease extent evaluation in the subsequent treatment planning. And for some, lung cancer, like the small cell lung cancer, it's not unusual to have you doing uh, uh, brain MRIs and uh, CTs just to roll out any brain uh, invasion. These are some pictorials of a uh, uh, presentation on radiology, and you can see uh, the past uh, the past X-ray at the extreme left uh, corner. You can see at the lower uh, left the left lung lower zone or lobe, you can see some uh, classification there where, the, where there was a mass. And you can see at the bottom where the arrow is on um, the CT. And then on the right, uh, that's the PET CT and how the how the lesions present and this FDG object on uh, imaging as well. So to this is uh, uh, some additional point on this. When you confirm this mass, that's when now you indulge the interventional radiology who now will assist you in an image-guided biopsy of the mass. Remember, these masses are in an internal organ, so you cannot do it uh, guided uh, through your eyes, so you need image guidance. And then the tissue now is submitted to the pathologist who now confirms this lung cancer, which type of lung cancer, and probably conduct a little bit of immunosecurity just to confirm uh, which lung cancer it is. And the CT scans are both diagnostic and also important in staging the extent of this disease. And the same purpose is served by the PET-CT. But as we know, PET-CT is quite expensive and only limited centers in the country. I think uh, only one public facility and uh, uh, I think one private facility has that amenity. So we can use what we have and it has been shown to work now and then. So in terms of other uh, diagnostic procedures, and I think uh, uh, Dr. Andrew will touch on this for some uh, tumors that are set more central. You can apply bronchoscopy that you can do washing plus a biopsy. Yeah, I already talked about the CT guided lung biopsy. Uh, you can also do endoscopic ultrasound just to determine the uh, amount of nodal involvement of these patients and probably even do an FMA at the same time. You can also do um, uh, endobronchial ultrasounds and transbronchial needle aspiration just to determine some of these nodes are they really involved. And this is really key determining uh, for determining whether disease is resectable at that point. Uh, we can also do uh, media sinoscopy for localized disease and uh, to assess media sinolithmos on imaging. You can also do pleural fluid aspiration and cytology. You can also do um, the PFTs just to assess the patient um, uh, suitability of a common status and also cardiac assessment. Remember, uh, lung is interlinked with uh, so many other major organs of the body. So I'll skip the treatment because Dr. Andrew will touch on it and I'll go straight to the interventions. 
and the roles for the uh, primary healthcare providers, give us a workers in uh, how we can detect uh, this uh, this lung cancer early. And you know, uh, it is really a multifactorial um, uh, way or a strategy in combating this or catching them quite early. We look at the prevention, uh, how are we promoting healthy lifestyle? Uh, there's a common uh, saying nowadays, uh, sitting the new smoking. Uh, look at tobacco control. Are we implementing that tobacco control act? Uh, and even the shisha have been banned, but there's still frequent use uh, in, in, in the, in the uh, life clubs and other recreational spaces. And then we have uh, uh, national screening programs for amenable cancers. I know lung cancer is not currently listed as one of the amenable cancers for screening in the country. And we all know that screening uh, criteria should have um, uh, public health uh, significance, should have uh, interventions ready at hand, and should be also cost effective. So what am I really saying about this? Uh, are we are we documenting our data out there about on the, on the lung cancer cases we have? Are we showing the true burden of lung cancer? Because if you can show the true burden and significance in terms of public health, then probably this could be considered as one of the uh, cancers who can have a national screening program. Remember, there's a study uh, that was uh, conducted in the US establishing, or rather checking the roles for the use of low-dose CT on uh, detecting uh, these lung nodules. And the, 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 the trial showed that uh, uh, lung cancer screening low-dose CT actually showed uh, uh, positive results in terms of uh, it detected or rather save 20% of lung cancer cases mortality just from the low dose CT uh, screening. And that's a, a big difference if you look at it. However, the cost effectiveness, effectiveness is what is not uh, replicable in our setting due to the uh, cost limitations uh, or effectiveness in our center. Remember, we don't even have CT scans everywhere. So that's really uh, tricky. Then we have uh, some programs for prompt diagnosis of symptomatic patients uh, uh, for prompt treatment as well, as well as building capacity for health workers to have high of suspicion. So at this point, I'll beg the question. We have the virtual school for uh, cancer uh, for healthcare providers. How many of us have subscribed or uh, enrolled for that virtual academy for us to learn how does lung cancer present? What are the symptoms and signs? How can I get better at building this high index of suspicion? Because remember, us as the primary health, healthcare providers, this is where now we pick these cases quite early and we can be able now to channel them or link them up or navigate them to the specialist, the radiologist, the pulmonologist, to the oncologist as well uh, for this prompt diagnosis and prompt treatment. So my take here is that we can be advocates in terms of promoting healthy lifestyle. We can enforce the tobacco control. We can enforce all these uh, agents of smoking that have been shown to contribute to uh, uh, lung cancer, as well as now the screening, though this does not fall upon us. But then at our regular chest clinics or TB clinics, are we seeing these cases that are not responding to the anti uh, uh It is knowledge that after two months of anti -TBs or even two weeks, that patient actually shows remarkable improvements. So if that is not happening to your patient, then that uh, fact that it could be lung cancer should be uh, well considered. Uh, the other priority area of intervention would be a uh, high quality diagnostic network. I, I won't belabor this a lot because uh, I think uh, we are focusing on the primary healthcare providers. But then uh, this, all these services are linked. And remember, all this will trickle down from the healthcare, from the primary healthcare giver who trickles or links that patient to the right service. And that's the only way that we can be able to, to, to catch these cases quite, quite early. Uh, so speak about diagnosis, referrals. Are we educating ourselves every day on the side of lung cancer and what can be done? And in terms of policies, I won't speak a lot because I think uh, forums like this one, uh, the National Cancer Control Program, have a lot of uh, uh, policies in place with the guidance, the guidance on how to guide us and how to proceed. We already talked about the documentation and bridges to show the significance of burden of lung cancer. We should also, uh, though this is not for this forum, operational research, uh, which is supported from the registry, can also be effective in uh, trying to get some programs that can be able to detect these lung cancer cases early enough. I've already talked about linkage with early detection. 
uh, infrastructure. Uh, we can have the X phase. And remember, wherever you are in this country, it's good to be friends uh, or collaborate very nicely with the radiologist. Make them your friends. If you find this uh, equivocal findings on an X ray, can you uh, ring him and get him uh, to advise you on what else can you do? Just so that you don't miss some of these cases that. Uh, would otherwise slip to the fingers and get TB treatment and get his lung cancer. Uh, of course, we have spoken about improvement to access to treatments. I think uh, that's uh, for Dr. Andrew to cover that and the treatment protocols as well. Uh, Multidisciplinary care, that I won't touch about it. Strong community involvement. Uh, do we have members of the public health care committees or healthcare providers in this? Uh, community are uh, they embedding themselves and giving their voices and even giving health talks uh, on some topics like lung cancer, smoking. You know, we can be able to use the community as a uh, uh, as, as a start point for this diagnosis and prevention of this uh, lung cancer. Of course, partnerships. I won't belabor that. Uh, and of course, now as you as the primary health caregiver, have you spoken to? The patients about even enrolling for uh, national insurance, NHIF, or whatever it's called right now, are they on board on it? So that this, this is very important because once you diagnose it and you send them to a specialist or to maybe KNH or MTRH, that insurance will be able, will ensure that they see the specialist, will be able to get the treatments. So we have a very huge, huge role to play, even as a, the primary health care givers and workers in this country. And so, in a nutshell, and this is my last slide. Uh, what is the role for us as primary healthcare workers in early detection? So we have the risk assessment and identification of high-risk individuals. We have the symptom recognition and follow-ups. We have the collaboration and referrals to specialists, that is the geologists, pathologists, pulmonologists, oncologists, et cetera, et cetera. How are we documenting these cases for records? And that's for the registry. Um, are we uh, the first advocates for uh, smoking cessation? Are we educating our patients on lung cancer and creating the awareness that is needed? Are we uh, interacting with the community in terms of outreaches and advocacy and making them aware of lung cancer and uh, what can be done and which hospitals provide these services? So I think in a nutshell, as, as I close, uh, primary health care and uh, I'll say give us providers and workers have a very huge role to play in uh, the early detention and possibly even uh, prevention of lung cancer in our country in this setting. So I'll stop it at that. Thank you for your time and uh, your attention. These are some of my references, some I've not listed, but uh, feel free to ask any questions once the Q&A is up. Thank you, over to you back, uh, David. Wow, wow. That's quite uh, some good lesson and some good presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, the thumbs up virtually uh, is a good confirmation and, and the many flowers that are coming on board that yes, uh, it's worth information. Uh, we will be taking questions from the chat. So if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to type them in. I will usher in uh, the next panelist or uh, speaker, we are glad to have him, uh, Dr. Andrew Ward, uh, who is a specialist physician, uh, pulmonologist from Kenyatta, is trained in the University of Nairobi, he did his MBCHB and MED in internal medicine. He's also done many other studies with diploma, I mean, HAMS, HAMS diploma in respiratory medicine. And he's also got a certification in interventional pulmonology. Uh, Goldnick is, is affiliated to many uh, societies. And uh, on a light note, he, his hobby is watching birds. Uh, he may, if we have time, he will tell us which is his favorite bird and probably I'm like a bird. <laughs> Just an allied note, but uh, welcome so much, Dr. Andrew. 
for a short session and then we will have uh, an interaction uh, with questions, comments and answers. Thank you. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes, you're audible. Thank you. Thank you so much, David, uh, for the uh, very kind introduction. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, give you, to try, to try and dispense some knowledge with regards to lung cancer. The month of May has been lung cancer awareness. And we are grateful that uh, all of you online were able to attend. I think you're close to 700 uh, attendees, participants in actually this talk. We do not have much time, so I'll just take it up from where Anton left. Uh, I have a disclaimer, I am not an uh, oncologist and I feel like uh, our talks should have been swapped. He should have talked about treatment and I should have talked about the other elements. But all, yeah, all is well, I think I'm up to the task. So um, we'll just go through a few objectives, our learning objectives, uh, lung cancer management, uh, Courtesy of NDT, which Dr. Anthony has already mentioned, and then treatment of the various types of lung cancer that are there, and then some issues about patient centered care in lung cancer. Um, Dr. Anthony had already mentioned about this big team of people who actually generally have an expertise in lung cancer. So you have thoracic surgeons, and the role of the thoracic surgeon here is mainly for patients with early lung cancer because uh, for solid tumors, as you may well know, uh, cure for, lung, for, for solid tumors is actually generally surgery. So when we hear somebody lung cancer is going for surgery, then it means that our, our attempt is actually to try and cure the patient of their lung cancer. Um, when you hear the rest of the people in that list, then sometimes you may be a bit concerned. So when you see the medical oncologists, the radiation oncologists, these are doctors who are actually uh, cancer specialists and treatment falls into their domain. And the, most of the time they'll be the team leads with regards to cancer uh, treatment. So there are chest radiologists who usually be reading your CT scans to tell you that there's a suspicion for cancer or there's progression of disease when you're doing surveillance for these patients. Interventional pulmonologists like myself, majorly our work is usually the diagnostics part where with the interventional radiologists. So the interventional radiologists will be uh, taking biopsies, um, what you call transthoracic with the CT. We also do uh, biopsies through ultrasound guided biopsies if the lesions are near the chest wall. And then um, there's also patients who present with the tumors that are in the center of the chest, which usually say central tumors. And that's where procedures like bronchoscopy come into the fore. And sometimes uh, when you can't tease out uh, what is going on, then bronchoscopy will usually be able to give you a diagnosis of TB with a sensitivity of 99%. Um, and if a patient also has cancer, in one sitting, you're able to make a diagnosis of TB uh, or lung cancer in the same city. Then there are pulmonary pathologists. These are pathologists with uh, uh, specialty in cancer uh, and lung diseases. And generally, when these biopsies are taken either by the pulmonologist or the radiologist, uh, then usually they land the pathologist, and the pathologist is the one to assign what type of cancer the patient will generally have. We also have oncology pharmacists because uh, when it comes to treatment, they are the ones who manage usually the treatment and actually administer these medications. And then you have the oncology nurses who usually uh, will be there with the patients, uh, making sure that those uh, medications, uh, they give the medications. The pharmacists will prepare, the oncology nurses will usually give the medications. And some of the oncology nurses actually are also uh, patient supporters in terms of navigating and just trying to help patients uh, through uh, this illness because anybody when they are given a diagnosis of cancer is usually very distraught. And then you have not forgetting palliative care specialists. So not all the time will you be able to treat. Sometimes the patient best supportive care will be what is important and the palliative care specialist will usually come in. Actually, as time goes by, we're actually bringing them on board much, much earlier in terms of planning for these patients. Now, generally with regards to treatment of lung cancer, you can either have surgery, you can either have systemic therapy or radiation. Those are the three modalities of treatment for patients with, with cancer. And generally for surgery, it will usually be either be open, what you call a thoracotomy, or actually video assisted. Or right now in the developed world, they're actually using robots to actually do these surgeries. And then um, the surgeries will usually be either 
a segmentectomy, lobectomy, or uh, pneumonectomy or a subglobal resection. Systemic therapies, this is where the field of lung cancer has really, really uh, blown up. So we have chemotherapy, good old chemotherapy. Of course, the issues here is usually side effects. And then there's now targeted and immunotherapy, which is quite exciting. We'll see this as we go along. Radiation therapy has not been left behind. There is uh, external beam radiation and some of your centers may actually have this. Um, there is a conformational radiation therapy, intensity modulated radiation therapy, and there's stereotactic uh, body radiation therapy. These ones may only be probably in level six hospitals. So probably I think two or three hospitals in Kenya have this equipment. Now, what with regards to management of lung cancer, what do you need to do? So the, 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 usually what you want to know is the prognostic factors. So the type of cancer that the patient has, the grade of the cancer that the patient has, size and location of the tumor, uh, stage of the tumor at diagnosis, age of the person, gender, uh, tests, other tests that the patient have, other comorbidities, uh, the patient's specific response to treatment, and that's generally the overall health and physical condition of the patients. Now, with regards to cancer, you usually have to stage. I'm not going to, to go through this. This is just for you to see. There's American uh, 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 group uh, that is actually involved in lung cancer. And basically, with regards to lung cancer, this is how the staging is. They actually follow the TMM staging. So usually the size of the tumor will be one, and then the nodes of the tumor, the nodes in the, in the, in the mediastinum will actually usually tell you. So if you have a tumor on the right side and the patient has positive nodes on the left side, it means that the patient is in, is in stage 3B or 4, if a patient has a pleural effusion, and this is actually quite common, many patients will actually present with pleural effusions and um, will actually be managed as TB. I want to say this categorically. If you, you've seen the ages that uh, Dr. Anthony had put, most of our lung cancer patients are not as old as the Western world. The Western world, the cutoff is, I think, for screening 55 to 75. For us here in Kenya or in Africa, I think, our cutoffs for, 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 for cancers is a bit earlier. So I probably go for 45. If you see a 45 year old lady, a 45 year old man coming to you with signs of TB, make sure you screen them for cancer. I repeat, 45 years old, TB starts, the, the, the likelihood of TB starts to reduce. TB is a young people's disease. So people, somebody in their twenties, yes, I have a 26 year old lung cancer, but generally, um, you'll not miss, um, you'll miss very few cancers but if, you, if, you, if, you, if you treat 20 years for TB, but a 45 year old being treated for TB clinically, there's a problem, okay? So one of the things that you can do as a primary healthcare is to make sure that you confirm the diagnosis, especially in persons above the age of 45. Unfortunately, lung cancer, uh, does not have any specific symptoms. The symptoms are indistinguishable from asthma. They're indistinguishable from TB. The patients will both cough. The patients may both have nitrates. Uh, the patients may both be losing weight. So, um, and generally by the time a patient has symptoms, we are late, we are already in stage four. So unfortunately, lung cancer is a silent sort of cancer. Most of the patients who've been found early is incidental. I had a gentleman who did a bronchoscopy last week. And basically, the reason why he ended up uh, in our bronchoscopy suite is because a member of his household had actually developed TB. He went for screening, and luckily, somebody very intelligent decided to do imaging. So they did chest X-ray. I would recommend for any TB patient, make every effort to do an imaging test, unless it is absolutely impossible. Make sure, it, no matter even if you get your genex, but we've seen patients who've both had TB and cancer at the same time. So with regards to staging, there'll be the regional nodes in the mediastinum, and then um, uh, we'll be looking for also metastasis, and metastasis is also staged, uh, M1, M1B, and M1C. So patients, for example, with a pleural effusion, just imagine a patient presenting with a pleural effusion and a node in the lung is already in stage four. Okay? It's already stage four lung cancer. This is just a, a slide to show you uh, staging of the lung cancer, how the staging is done, depending on the size of the tumor, the nodes, as I showed you previously, and then you also check for distant disease. Um, and then this is just to tell you where the patient presents. And if you look, 57% of patients 
okay, with lung cancer will present with metastasis. Okay, if you are the unknown, it's about 63% of patients. So majority of our patients will never come early. Okay, this is a challenge with lung cancer. The majority of the patients will not come early. I am yet to see a patient with early lung cancer in a long time. It's probably been a year or two since I saw the last patient with actually localized uh, lung cancer. Majority of the patients come late. And this is because I have a 60, I think a 62 year old lady. She's uh, I think referred from some in Western Kenya. Um, she's been treated for TB, I think twice. There's another one who was referred to me yesterday from Busia. Um, she started on anti-TBs uh, based on just the imaging and uh, sputum tests had not been done. Um, they said the image was miliary and that patient actually has lung cancer. Now, the other thing is um, depending on the stage, since most of our patients present with late stage lung cancer, okay, then uh, you can see the survival rate. If you have distant, then your survival rate is just about 4%. Only four, about 5% of patients will be alive at five years with lung cancer when it's distant. And these are just a survival cards to actually show you that um, if you actually get lung cancer early, that these patients will be able to live for more than 10 years. You can see these patients are still alive at 10 years. The survival patients in stage 1A and 1B, these patients are still alive. If you take the patients in stage 4, the more majority of them will be dead by year 3. Now, how do we manage early stage lung cancer? Early stage lung cancer will generally be managed by surgery. And uh, generally what will usually be done is either what you call a segment, segmentectomy, or you'll actually do a lobectomy, or sometimes you may actually do what you call a pneumonectomy. And generally when these surgeries are being done, we usually do sampling of the uh, ipsilateral nodes to just confirm that this disease had not spread. And that's why it's, as Dr. Anthony had mentioned, being a PET scan is really important before you actually send a patient for surgery because um, late we've seen so many patients already with brain nets and they just have a nodule in the lung, okay? Um, for patients who may, may not be amenable to surgery with early lung cancer, there is a role for stereotactic uh, radiotherapy. So these are for either patients who are medically inoperable, the patient either is so, has, has comorbidities, has COPD, doesn't have very good lungs, or the patient is too old, or the patient has uh, heart problems and things like that, or patients who actually refuse, you can actually give them hyperfunctionated radiotherapy to those uh, lesions and actually be able to, to treat. There are other options like radiofrequency therapy, ablation, therapy, and actually just observing, but these are yet to uh, come to the fore. With regards to surgery, you want to make sure that this patient will usually be assessed clinically, will be assessed, will actually have a, a satisfactory cardiopulmonary uh, assessment. So the patient will usually have pulmonary function tests done. These are the cutoffs for patients, depending on what surgery they are going to have. Uh, the patient's heart needs to be assessed. So they usually need a pre-op cardiological evaluation. So these are patients who've had a PET scan. They don't have any metastatic disease. Um, we've assessed quite well uh, the lungs and we've checked the heart and make sure they're okay. And then that's a patient who actually end up having surgery. Now, uh, when it comes to outcomes, a 30 day mortality rates for surgery is one to 3% for lobectomies and for pneumonectomy is a bit higher two to 11%. Challenge for menstrual patients with pneumonectomy is uh, sometimes life after the pneumonectomy may not be the same. Patients have quite severe limitations. In general, you need to remember active smokers have an increased risk of post-op complications. As a primary care workers, one of your roles, as Dr. Mshiri, sorry, as a, uh, Dr. Mshiri had mentioned, is actually uh, smoking cessation. That one, I think, is one of the things that we can actually be able to tackle because uh, looking at our data, for example, in Kenyatta, most of the patients, especially male, 50% of lung cancer by the way in Kenya is male, 50% is female. So, uh, there's no preponderance. Uh, it's 50-50 between men and females. Um, majority, almost all the men smoke. Unfortunately, we do not know why the women are getting lung cancer, but we presuppose it's actually either indoor pollution from actually using biomass uh, as a source of um, uh, energy, so uh, charcoal, firewood, and kerosene. Uh, perhaps uh, could actually uh, be putting uh, women at risk. Now, um, for patients who are tired, who have uh, what you call micrometastatic disease, you can still do a surgery and a, 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 a radiotherapy. And uh, for patients who are going for surgery, currently the 
the guidelines actually recommend that actually patients can actually receive uh, adjuvant uh, chemo, then they go for surgery to actually downstage the tumor. And then after that, they actually end up with the, sorry, new adjuvant. And then after that, they end up with adjuvant chemo. Um, and they actually are treatment options. So you can have chemo with radiotherapy uh, or new adjuvant chemo, then radio, then you get to surgery. So with regards to uh, adjuvant chemotherapy, these are done for patients who have positive nodes and uh, adjuvant radiation may be done where the surgeons may not have been able to get clear margins. So you actually try and make sure that you're able to kill all the killing cells. With regards to chemotherapy, what do you use for patients with non small cell lung cancer? Basically, it's usually a platinum-based uh, regimen. And uh, for patients with non squamous patients with adenocarcinoma, then you want to do carbo, uh, platinum compound plus penetrexin. For the squamous, then you can use um, the taxins or paclitaxel, or you can actually use docetaxel, vinerobin, and the others. Uh, um, the guidelines also recommend for patients uh, concurrent um, radiotherapy with uh, with uh, actually chemo. So the patient gets chemo and uh, radiotherapy at the same time, what you call concurrent radiotherapy. And um, then after that, the patient usually may end up with uh, consolidation. And this difficult time here, duvalumab is actually one of the new medications. This is actually what you call an immune checkpoint inhibitors. And these are new medications that are being used to just try and prolong overall survival for these cancer patients. Now what, how do we manage? So for early lung cancer, stage one, uh, to up to stage 3A, management in surgery, plus or minus radiotherapy, and the patients will usually be given uh, adjuvant chemotherapy to just uh, take care of my pregnancy. Uh, uh, any, any cancer cells that are still left. With regards to now advanced lung cancer, this is where most of our patients will usually present, is that uh, for the National uh, Cancer, Comprehensive Cancer Network, actually this is a recommendation that for patients with metastatic disease, you have to actually establish a histological type okay, of cancer, usually we'll do molecular tests. Um, you have to offer the patient smoking cessation counseling and your role, as I've already mentioned, is trying to get people to stop smoking. And then depending on the patient's state, you may actually integrate palliative care at that time. Now for histological type, the have mentioned, mentioned, you either have a beam, so you either have small cell or non-small cell. When it comes to non-small cell, you actually have adenocarcinoma, and uh, squamous cell carcinomas. But for with regards to treatment, you'll actually divide them into adeno, large cell or not otherwise specified, but squamous. For the ones who have adenocarcinomas, you usually have to check for what you call mutations because cancer has some genetic basis to it. So basically what you're now trying to do is to try and look, do you have certain genes that confer, uh, that, this, that is driving this uh, cancer that you have? And basically there are mutations like the EGFR, uh, ALK, ROS1, BRAF, and the PDL1. Okay. And uh, basically, if the tumor is expressing this, um, this, uh, uh, if the tumor is expressing this, uh, the, those markers, okay, uh, maybe you can say this, if the tumor is expressing these mutations, then you may actually end up getting what you call targeted therapy. And for PDL1 here, these are patients who end up, this is a, uh, test that we actually is called programmed uh, ligand death program death ligand one you check and the patients who express this they actually end up with immune uh, therapies so for patients with squamous lung uh, cell uh, carcinoma again if they do not have a history of smoking then you want to check for the EGFR and lung mutations you may consider those one and these ones are currently available you can actually test for, you actually now have EGFR testing in country. This is actually being done in uh, Aga Khan. Currently, it's being done at no cost to patients from public facilities, courtesy of AstraZeneca. And um, we also have a study that is going on for BRAF. And I know the Moi team here, the Dr. Shiri is actually doing PDL1 testing for patients who actually are ne have negative, who, have, who do not have, who do not express those other mutations. Uh, for patients with advanced uh, lung cancer, again, platinum uh, back, backbone, and then for, for adenocarcinomas, it will be a carboplatin plus phenotrexid or cisplatin plus phenotrexid. For squamous, they use the others, either a cisplat plus docetaxel or paclitaxel. And then they, 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 they may go after that for radiation. I generally, we tend to prefer concurrent uh, uh, chemo plus radiation. 
Uh, sometimes this may be difficult for patients to tolerate, but generally it will usually comply with the best results. And then uh, if the patients have, uh, for example, squamous, casi, squamous uh, uh, cell uh, carcinoma, then the, and their and the, and the, uh, the, the studies have actually shown that Duvalumab can actually be used. So just basically to go over uh, the mutations, if you have a GFAR mutation, or simatinib is generally preferred. We currently have a, an access program in Kenya for patients to actually be able to access osimatinib. And basically this is keeping patients alive for almost two, two, almost two three years. And before um, patients with lung cancer for just to about six months. Alk rearrangement for treatment is alectinib and crizotinib or rosuan crizotinib. These drugs are available, but they're extremely expensive. Uh, for patients with BRAF, we do not generally do this, but it's currently uh, in Kenya, we, do, we are not able to, to do this test. This test up to the center of the country. PDL1, we hopefully will be able to get PDL1 testing in, in, in country. Currently, we either have to send it to South Africa or India. And if patients express those PDL1 mutations, generally, if a patient has more than 50% PDL1 expression, then they'll end up with tendralizumab, which is in the same family as the volume up. If patients have 1 to 49, they'll end up with chemo. And patients with less than 1% uh, of PDL1 will end up with a platinum based compound plus chemo. And this is just a study to show patients with non smooth cell lung cancer. And basically, you can see the survival curves here. When pembrolizumab was added to chemo, these patients, uh, majority of them are still alive. So you can actually see at about uh, 18, uh, 12, 12 to 15 months, uh, the, the, the curve was flattening and uh, compared to placebo. So many more patients were alive compared to the ones who are just on chemo. And you can see the hazard ratios. Um, patients who never smoked get better uh, survival. And this is what we actually see with treatments. So for example, women tend to do better than men. Uh, just a case, this is a 64-year-old female uh, smoker presented with uh, double vision and difficulty in writing. This is just a case like Dr. Mishiri had presented. Patients sometimes you just present with uh, CNS uh, symptoms, nothing whatsoever. And um, MRI showed she had two lesions there, um, which were enhancing. This was suspected to be metastatic. And the cancers that tend to love the brain, number one is lung cancer, two would be uh, breast cancer. So PET scan was ordered and basically showed the patient actually had a nodule in the, in the right hilum right there. Uh, bronchoscopy with a conventional uh, transbronchial with elastration was done that revealed an unsmoked cell lung cancer. Um, patient ended up having uh, stereotactic radio surgery for the brain, got chemo, and uh, was commenced on a TKI uh, with some radiation to the nodule. The patient is still alive 24 months and still pushing on. With regards to small cell lung cancer, this one is usually spoke differently. Uh, it only, it's only about 15% of lung cancer it usually has poor prognosis. Um, the staging is usually just the same. However, we stage it differently. We usually stage it as limited or extensive stage disease. So patients who uh, do not have any metastatic disease would be called limited. And the ones who have metastasis, if they have a pleural effusion, would be actually extensive disease. Background again is a platinum based compound plus a top side, four to six cycles. Patients usually respond really well initially. However, if the patients uh, progress after that, then it usually means that now the tumor has developed um, pathways to actually be chemo insensitive. So, initially very chemo sensitive, but often develops drug resistance thereafter. Um, for patients who have limited disease, they can actually have surgery done if it is restricted to a loop and then followed by chemotherapy. Uh, sometimes uh, for the ones who are early, everybody else will usually get concurrent chemo and radiotherapy. And then um, if patients show progression, we usually do uh, imaging. And if patients have uh, CNS disease, then you want to do prophylactic cranial radiation. For extensive disease, it is just chemo. Uh, plus uh, immunotherapy, and I mentioned about uh, atezolizumab, valumab, and pembrolizumab are what we call PDL1 inhibitors. They are checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, very expensive drugs. I think at those years, about a million Kenya shillings. There's another one which was called nivolumab, which has been around, costs about half a million at those, and you're taking this every month. So if you have about 10 million, you just know how much time you have to live. Um, and then for patients, uh, palliative radiotherapy to those sites. So if a patient, for example, has superior venacava syndrome, you want to radiate 
a patient is having difficulty swallowing, you can radiate uh, to just try and uh, control their symptoms. Now, there's one element that is important that all of us have to take into uh, uh, consideration, and this is actually patient-centered care, um, that uh, not only are we treating the patient, uh, health, but uh, we are treating the patient in totality. So remember, we are partners with the patient in their health. Uh, we are not their parents. We are not headmasters. We actually have to acknowledge that the patient has autonomy to decide. Our job is just to give the patient uh, the best information that we have, and then the patients decide. So one of the things that uh, is a tenant for patient-centered care is patients should be able to access care continuity and transition, involvement of family and friends, if the patient wants. Uh, some patients may not want this, so you have to respect that. Emotional support, physical comfort of patients. Some of these patients, their what you call performance status is so poor, so you just want to keep them comfortable. You want to give them as much as information as possible, and as much as possible, integrate their care so that they don't have to come for clinics three times in a week. If possible, you can integrate everything to be done for those patients in one clinic, then that would be ideal. And then respect the patient's preferences. I've had patients, I've had a patient who would have managed to go for treatment uh, for chemotherapy, but she declined. The family was very distraught, but I told them that we have to respect the patient's wishes because at the time she was making that decision, she was of sound mind. So multidisciplinary involvement is the best way to approach to ensure patient-centered care really happens. Uh, we need to do surveillance for these patients who are still alive. We need to do CT scans to check for recurrence. Um, we have to manage long-term side effects for these treatments, fatigue, business, pain. And then age-appropriate cancer screening, as I mentioned, and uh, Dr. Mshiri had also mentioned, for us in Kenya, uh, perhaps if you have a 45-year-old uh, coming with uh, respiratory symptoms at your TB clinic, please, please, please make sure that patient gets up imaging test done, make sure that that uh, X-ray or CT scan is reported, uh, especially if there are abnormalities, so that we're able to pick up these patients a bit early. Um, as I've told you, symptoms were a bit, but would learn to get some of these patients a bit earlier when their performance status is still good, because uh, when the patient's performance status is good, they can be able to, uh, they can actually be able to undergo all these treatments. But if the performance status is not good, then this patient will not be given chemotherapy or any of these, thera any of these therapies because the patient's status is poor and we may not be able to tolerate the treatments. It is important to vaccinate these patients. Again, I want to remind you that uh, it is important to make sure that your patients are vaccinated against influenza, against pneumonia, and where a number of elderly people coming up with actually chicken pox. Okay, and then um, health promotion. Uh, so people to eat healthy diets, physical activity, limit alcohol, uh, uh, smoking cessation, and pulmonary rehabilitation are important for these patients. And then since we are managing, you are not managing cancer, you are managing a human being, we have to make sure that we check everything else. You know, check their blood pressure, their sugars, their bone health, cholesterol, their teeth. Are they, are they, are they protected from the sun and things like that? Uh, there is uh, palliative uh, management that can be done for pain. Uh, radiation comes in here quite well for bone metastasis. The palliative care team also will help with pain. Patients who have uh, neurological symptoms like spinal cord compression or brain metastasis, radiation actually is, can help. Patients with bleeding uh, from tumors, radiation helps there. Patients who have dyspnea or dysphagia because the tumor is causing obstruction, these are patients actually who could benefit from palliative radiation. So the story of lung cancer, the beginning is prevention. And the prevention here is smoking cessation. So combined pharmacological and behavioral therapy is the most effective. Um, the, 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 the lung cancer screening trials done called the Nelson trial. Uh, they actually, in the US, they actually screened 55 to 24 year olds with more than uh, 30 pack years uh, who are actually still smoking or have stopped, stopped smoking up to 15 years ago. Um, with the middle for the lung cancer story. So this is where your role comes in. Uh, smoking cessation. We do not currently have an early. So for lung cancer, we do not call it a screening. We actually call it early detection because majority of, of this disease is actually asymptomatic. So we do, we, we do not do screening like we do for pap smears and the like here uh, because we, are, we haven't been able to identify all the risk factors. We know smoking is a big one, but as I've mentioned, majority, half of our patients are female. And here in Kenya, uh, smoking rates in the female, yes, is increasing. So we expect 
the numbers of lung cancer to go up. But I don't have 60 year olds. I think it's the smoke in the kitchen that they've been smoking that is putting them at risk. We do not have cutoffs of how much kerosene, charcoal, or uh, fire would have been exposed to, to be able to say that if you've been exposed to this X amount of years of charcoal, then you should do a lot of CT. But generally, this would uh, this uh, would probably pick up majority of the men because um, unfortunately, when the men develop lung cancer, they don't do as well even with regards to those treatments. And majority of those mutations, we actually that I'd mentioned before, we actually see. Uh, the middle point is uh, diagnosis and treatment. This one you require an integration of multidisciplinary care between the diagnosticians like myself, the radiologists, the pathologists, and the oncologists uh, to try and make a diagnosis and, and find the best way for treating patients, monitoring for recurrence. Uh, the oncologists should usually refer back these patients to ourselves to actually do rebiopsies to actually check for recurrence, and then survivorship care, as I mentioned before. The end is actually palliation, early palliative care involvement. So generally, in KNH, we actually have a palliative care team. So we try and involve this, them early when we just made the diagnosis, uh, and then effective symptom management. Everybody uh, deserves uh, to die in dignity, even if they have a terminal illness. And then appropriate advanced care planning and the use of hospice care. These are my references, and we can take any questions from here. Thank you very much. I'm in my oh, great. Uh, and I like that ending in terms of uh, thinking around beginning palliative care from the time of diagnosis and involvement of the teams, multidisciplinary teams, then hashtag high index of suspicion from the time you're interacting with this patient at the first time. Um, thank you so much, Doc, for that input and also having covered a bit of treatment. It's, a, it's a, an inspiration for us to also want to, you know, even specialize. Uh, I saw a question around uh, initiatives that respond to lung cancer. And uh, from Kenya Hospices and Palliative Care Association, we are undertaking an initiative, though not supporting direct patients' diagnosis, but awareness and responses around lung cancer. We began in 20. 21, and unfortunately, most of the patients who are enrolled then have passed on. Unfortunately, may they rest in peace. And so, the more reason as to why these kind of conversations need to continue so that we'll be able to you know, get the patients in good time for early interventions. So, thanks so much. Um, we will have about 15 minutes of interactions. Uh, I saw some three questions which <clears throat> have been responded to, but I just wanted to invite Anthony just to give a quick comment on question one, which was around uh, uh, vaping, you know, that's vaping or vaping, depending on which school someone went to, and e-cigarettes in cancer studies are still, uh, uh, you know, still premature so that we inconclusive so because other forms of smoking involves some other products of combustion so if uh, uh anthony you can just make a quick comment on that and then uh on the second hand smoke from firewood and cooking should this be considered as a community health i mean by community health promoters as they go to the community and they do so all right, thank you, David, and uh, thank you, Dr. Vishana, for your question. And uh, I absolutely agree with you in uh, the effect of vaping and the e-cigarette on the incidence of lung cancer. Patients, yeah. Uh, being that it's it's not well established in terms of um, the causality, but uh, that is mainly due to the confounding effects of the the patient also being uh, cigarette smokers, most of them. And uh, most of the literature to check uh, will say it's not very conclusive. So I totally agree with you. But nonetheless, uh, I think if you look at our population for most people, they will probably start with 
uh, the ordinary uh, stick, cigarette stick, and then probably go to the vaping or even vice versa. So either way, I think uh, there's still more work to be done in terms of studies to see the the association on this in terms of uh, incidence and causality problem. Uh, to the second question uh, about uh, it's about the household smoke. Yeah, so th th there's a role actually for the uh, community health promoters to sensitize the community. And the reason is that uh, the indoor smoke and pollutions, they have been shown to be a series of uh, multiple respiratory problems, not just uh, lung cancer alone. We have other COPDs as well. But then in particular, as I come down to lung cancer, that there has been shown to be an increased incidence. And in particular, I think uh, there was one study that has been done uh, in China and had shown that uh, the lifetime risk had, uh, was increased to approximately 20%. So there is the, that association that has been established, and uh, as we call them, the health promoters then can uh, advise properly on a proper indoor ventilation, uh, probably the smokeless decals, or even outside uh, cooking, or even uh, uh, heating for those purposes, just to reduce the amount of exposure uh, to our population. Over to you, uh, Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, as I pick the other questions that have, uh, have come in, uh, there was a webinar, similar webinar conducted on the 31st of August. And I would request Dr. Andrew just to make a comment on this question. TB and lung cancer can actually coexist. As I once had a patient who turned smear negative after one month, but still coughing. So CT scan nailed the diagnosis. Uh, I know you've emphasized issues around the uh, scanning and CT scan. Maybe just a quick comment on that. And as you do that, uh, I will share the other questions that have come in uh, and will request us just to respond to them based on our areas of expertise. I'll just share screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me, let me just go over. There's a question in the chat about uh, cigarette smoke and plural effusion. Uh, chest CT scan didn't pick anything apart from the plural effusion. Gene expert was negative. What would be the next appropriate step? Um, this patient requires a referral to maybe k &H where we can actually do plural biopsy uh, so that uh, we biopsy that plura um, to try and get a diagnosis. Sometimes, because this patient is a cigarette smoker, so he's already at risk. Uh, the other, there, of course, there are many causes of a plural effusion. What would actually usually recommend, if you can, is just take some fluid and do what you call biochemistry and cytology. There's a patient I got from Bagathi. They just took some fluid. Unfortunately, they saw that patient on anti-TBs, but the fluid just showed he had malignant cells. So basically, he had uh, lung cancer that was arising from his pleura. So this actually does happen. So uh, again, this patient was about 50 years old. I have told, I'll, I'll repeat again, 45 years old and above, do not just quickly start a patient on antibiotics. Please check for comorbidities. If possible, like the case that um, David has mentioned, do imaging. Please do an imaging test so that you're able to see because you could actually have both TB and, uh, and cancer at the same time, although it's rare, but it can happen. And then two, especially for those patients who are clinically diagnosed, try and make an effort to get a bacteriological confirmation mission because majority of these patients are actually masquerading. The reason why uh, cancer, lung cancer has actually become uh, important even nationally is we did an audit of our TB data and we noticed that the patients who are clinically diagnosed had a poorer outcome compared to the ones who the diagnosis was confirmed. So patients who are bacteriologically confirmed versus one who are clinically diagnosed, the ones who are clinically diagnosed, their outcomes were bad. They, they were the majority of the ones who died. And this is actually what formed the basis of trying to find out what would lead to the demise of these people. And yet for some of these patients, we actually found it was lung cancer. Patients have been treated four times for TB and it's actually cancer that the patient has. And as I've shown you, this patient doesn't have much time. So they need to get a diagnosis made early. And then if possible, go into treatment so that you can keep them alive. Unfortunately, again, symptoms, you're late. By the time the patient has symptoms, you're late. If you have smokers uh, who have more than 20 pack years above the age of 45, you can actually screen. 
and just make sure that they do recommend them to stop smoking and then try and do an imaging test to just screen. Okay, I think we can go to what is shared on the screen. Um, I think vaping has been mentioned by my colleague. Uh, is there a program that supports lung cancer diagnosis? Uh, Anthony, your team in Ampath were doing this before. Are you still doing? They were, they were supporting cancer. I think you're supporting um, uh, city guided biopsies. Uh, unfortunately, in Kenya, NHIF doesn't support so much the diagnostics, but we are trying to negotiate. Hopefully, with the new social health, we'll probably be able to get there in terms of support for the diagnostics. But the treatment, they, they, they do offer some support. But I know the team in, uh, in Moi had a pro the, the ICI had a program where they're actually supporting uh, biopsies for patients. I don't know if this is still going on. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that still exists. I know they have a, a lung cancer program, but it has gone down more to the treatment phase. I would have to confirm about the, the, the diagnostics of, of it. What I know is the program you mentioned for the EGFR testing at uh, uh, some hospitals, like Khan, KU, MTRH, KNH, and ourselves and some other hospitals around here. Uh, apart from that, I'm not aware of any other programs. Courtesy of uh, AstraZeneca, uh, they actually have a drug, a terosim kinase inhibitor called osimatin, which is actually first line for patients with non-small cell lung cancer who have adenocarcinoma and express the EGFR mutation. So currently, the EGFR mutation studies are being done at no cost, uh, but if this patient will need to have had a histological diagnosis or a cytological diagnosis of an adenocarcinoma. Um, role of second and smoking has been mentioned. Um, one of the things for the health promoters, perhaps, they, there's a study they did in India. Basically, what they did is just increasing a window in those kitchens in the rural areas to just try and reduce the indoor pollution. So maybe this is something to recommend, because uh, I know there are certain places in the country like central Kenya where, because of the weather, um, they, they do a lot of indoor cooking with biomass. But um, maybe just increasing the amount of ventilation would be good. I think we've answered the plural effusion uh, part. Uh, the cigarette smoker, this one will require maybe to be seen by a pulmonologist. Uh, to be able to help that patient to actually get a diagnosis. Um, uh, somebody asked here, have we considered the possibilities of unresolved biological conflict as probably cause of cancers in general and lung cancer in particular? Um, can cancer is, has been there since time immemorial. Cancer is not new. Uh, what has improved is our diagnostics there. There were studies done, I think, in early 1930, and cancer was the second cause of death among natives. So our, our forefathers still died of cancers too, um, and that's why they are not here. Um, but there are some genetic, cancer is both genetic and environmental factors. So for example, you are at risk genetically and then you start smoking or you're exposed to biomass and then you get, you get, you get uh, cancer. Um, uh, how available and affordable are the treatment modalities in our public hospitals? Our National Hospital Insurance Fund actually supports cancer treatment. Um, and then we currently are trying to roll out an access program for those patients with adenocarcinomas because there's a pharmaceutical company that uh, actually has the drug for this. Um, we hope that the other companies with the other expensive drugs may actually also uh, do the same. Um, Lodo CT. Uh, Lodo CT is actually, Lodo CT is not a different type. It's just the technique of doing the CT. Uh, because remember, exposure to radiation also is a, is a risk factor to, to cancer. So we do not want these patients to increase their lifetime risk of uh, developing secondary malignancies by exposing them to a lot of um, radiation, and that's why it is low dose. The low dose is just to actually mitigate for secondary malignancies, and therefore you expose a patient to less uh, radiation than the conventional CT, because this is a patient who will be screened Serially. So if you're going to have five CT scans in the next uh, six years, that's quite a hefty dose of CT. So um, the recommendation was for low dose CT, which I think, if I'm not wrong, is about uh, the equivalent to about six chest radiographs, because a conventional CT would be able to actually be about 40 uh, chest radiographs. So this is just reduced exposure to radiation. I don't know if there are any more questions, uh, David. <laughs> Majority of the other 
comments or question on the QA is around CPD. And I hope I'm hoping the hosts will be able to sort the CPD questions. Uh, and we wanted to finish so, uh, at this time. So thank you so much for answering the questions. And if you have any other, please just feel free to email them. Uh, Elaine will keep track and probably ensure that you answered all the KNH team. Otherwise, uh, I want to call the meeting to close, but thanking Elaine, the NCCP communications person, really for organizing and ensuring that this webinar is well done. The participants, we had about uh, 720. Uh, the panelists, you've done really well. Thank you so much, um, uh, Dr. Andrew and Anthony for sharing lots of knowledge. And the audience truly acknowledge my sentiments. You can see the emotions up there. Lots of love, lots of claps, lots of thumbs up. Asante, asante sana. And so I see an announcement that in the evening, there will be another webinar. Uh, on understanding UHC and the social health insurance framework. I would encourage all of us to really to inject in our thoughts and our ideas into this kind of discussions because all these things shape our health system for the good of the patient. Let's not forget the patient at the end of the day it's about influence quality of life to our patients. And so I want to applaud everyone for coming and so we end at that unless there is any other comment. We will see you in the next webinar. Thank you and God bless. Thank you all. And uh, Thank you, David. Have, a nice, have a nice day. Thank you. So I'm trying to see. I don't think people